I'm going to talk about uh, biomedical engineering research and the kind of future parts of it, but a little bit later we'll be talking about the future parts and embedded really with the, some of the scars and um, that I've endured or suffered um, going through this uh, journey. But in terms of biomedical engineering at the start, so it's there's a debate goes on as to what it actually is. So because there's a lot of terms that get used interchangeably. So in well. Okay, this is my version of how it works. So in terms of what bioengineering is, it's essentially any engineering that's associated with anything biological. So frame that down to uh, orientated towards humans, then you get what's biomedical engineering. So that would include cell and tissue work. A lot of what I do was actually um, biomedical engineering because as my background was um, as, as an engineer rather than coming at it from the science side of it. And then kind of, you know, the future probably of this area is getting towards what's called mechanobiology, which is how mechanical forces determine how biological um, tissue behaves and how cells behave. Then we have the whole argument of science versus engineering. And uh, so I'm an engineer and I kind of you know, like to distinguish between both. But um, when you do research, you know, all of it is essentially considered science. So you do the science of engineering and developing different things. Now, some people argue that scientists kind of figure out problems and engineers solve them. And a lot of people think that that's insulting to scientists, and I don't think it is at all. It's a very important part of what goes on is to understand what is wrong. And then if we can figure out what is wrong, you can figure out ways to try and fix it. So as a discipline, biomedical engineering you know, is actually quite new. Um, so for example, for somebody to say they graduate as a biomedical engineer, the first of those would only have been in the early 90s. Um, for example, in UL, the first biomedical engineers were, uh, it was an option in mechanical engineering. Those first graduates were in 2003. The first actual B engine biomedical engineering was at, in 2007. Um, so it's, you, you can see by that it's a relatively new discipline or it's certainly being um, considered on its own. Now, that said, it's not like that this biomedical engineering, what it actually is, is only that young. So you can go back a long, long way to figure out that biomedical engineering has in fact been used to treat people. Um, so this is Hippocrates, so 400 BC, and you know you can see there a very simple external fixator to, to help fix a broken leg. So, and this is quite a while ago, I, it kind of upset me when I saw this picture, because I teach medical design, device design to fourth years, and you know, I'm pretty sure that even at this stage, and as far and as long as, or as well as our education is, that trying to produce something as elegant as this, a solution as elegant as this, is uh, still a little bit beyond a lot of us. Um, so moving on, kind of 2,000 years later, um, so these are some medical devices that interested me, particularly this is a petit tourniquet. So these are just an image is actually from around 1700, but these were around about 200 years at that stage. But what interested me most was that even then they figured out that these were, um, prior to this, limbs were sawn off quickly. Now the word quickly entertained me, so they even knew then sawing something off slowly was slightly, was, wasn't going to be so good for patients. And then it was cauterized with red hot iron, so that's how they figured it out. So then you get engineers involved and you try and figure out better ways to do stuff. So the advent of modern biomedical engineering then, orthopedics would have driven a lot of it because it, particularly with the hip replacements, um, that was such a big success. Um, in the 60s. So as you can see here, so you've done Charnley's one in uh, 1962 and it probably took you know less than five or six years for this to become widespread. Um, but even at that, so that, this is almost 50 years old as technology now and you still get the, these kind of occurrences here. So it's not that even though we've got very mature technologies and approaches to things and good successes, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. So this is the Dupuy um, ASR our hip replacement, so they were you know, selling it as a quite a well-engineered solution and an upgrade to existing technologies, um, mm -hmm. but ended up having quite a lot of complications in terms of, because it was a metal on metal um, bearing, and these are discussions we've had uh, with the guys out in Croom about this. So in most of my talk, that's probably for the orthopedic people in the room, that's really almost the end of it. There's a little bit at the, um, at the end of the talk, just to keep people that they're orthopedic orientated involved but most of the stuff I'll talk about will be what I do which is essentially fluid mechanics and biological fluid mechanics so um, so it wasn't just in the 60s that all the orthopedic stuff was going on so in 1967 what we had was essentially the first but this was the first using a healthy vein to look at bypass surgery um, and this obviously then became a big success and, and the competing technologies in the early 90s then were looking at stents trying to treat this problem 
but essentially they took a vein into the aorta and stitched it on. So this is the blockage here. So blood comes out of the left ventricle, comes down here into the coronary artery. You've got a blockage here, so you get no blood supply to the heart tissue. So they put in a bypass graft, which allows blood flow, blood flow to flow around the blockage. And about 30 years after this was first done, I started my PhD looking at um, uh, essentially bypass surgery, peripheral vascular disease, and looking at the hemodynamics associated with bypass surgery. And as Brian mentioned in his introduction, so I did this. My uh, supervisor was Professor Tim McLaughlin out in, in UL, and uh, the first meeting I had with discussing this project was uh, Professor Pierce Grace was in, there, in the room as well. So that kind of showed us straight away that you were kind of working not only just with engineers, but with clinicians. And, trying to develop multidiscipline uh, type teams. And this image then was actually, I took this specifically from a talk. So, um, so as I was doing my PhD, there was a, a registrar, um, our senior reg, uh, Amy Kavner, was actually working under Professor Grace. So this was one of the talks that he put together. And we've been kind of more or less collaborating ever since. So a lot of the stuff I'll show you will be kind of mentioning that. So looking at peripheral vascular disease, essentially what you get is, because you've got a blockage here in the artery, you, you don't really have any flow. So this is kind of one of those weird pictures where you show not something, or not showing something means something. Um, but in cartoon form, essentially if you consider this is your hip up here and your knee down here, if this is your femoral artery, what you do is essentially you've got a blockage here. This is, and we do quite a bit of work on these kind of plaques now um, in terms of what they're made up as tissue. But, for hemodynamically, what happens is basically the flow just comes in, goes around it, and essentially flows back out. <coughs> now the problems with bypass grafts, because if there wasn't any problems then there wouldn't need to be do, do any further research on them, is that if you look at this area down here, is that they have what called modern patency rates. So this really refers to whether they stay open or not. Um, and these would be what we call restenosis at the heel, toe, and bed of the junction. So these are just particular locations. So you get disease forming here, here and on the bed of the junction. Now you can argue that at the anastomosis there's other factors at play um, such as material mismatch. So you've got a really synthetic graft and a kind of compliant artery. So you get different uh, mismatch material properties so when it blood is pressurized you can get stretching there. But on the bed of the junction there's just hemodynamics and abnormally hemodynamics at play, excuse me. So these what we call consider areas of abnormal wall shear stress. And these shear stresses are essentially now you can consider them as the frictional forces that act on endothelial cells, they're not forces, they're stresses, but I mean in terms of conceptually you can consider them like that. So these would be abnormal, so they're frictional forces that rub the top of the endothelial cells in a certain way, the endothelial cells don't like it, and they um, start a uh, disease formation cascade. So what that cascade is, is still not that well understood. Again, this is one of the cartoons I took from Eamon's presentation that he gave at Charing Cross in 2005, but essentially you've got flow coming down, and in arterial um, flow, flow essentially bifurcates, so it goes from one to two, and it all branches off down to get the flow to distribute down to the capillaries. Whereas when you create this the junction, the flow comes in and it hits off the arterial wall that's opposite the anastomosis. You get these abnormal shear stresses. These cause essentially these endothelial cells to secrete mitogen, so growth factors which can give you a smooth muscle cell proliferation and essentially what happens is that this overgrows, grows into the lumen, the lumen is a space where blood flows and that blocks and um, so it stops blood flow and therefore you end up with the same problem again. Now some of the work just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on, so this is just some experimental, so what we call flow visualization. So this is just water flowing through a tube here um, in an idealized fashion, but it's just colored so you can see it. And you can see the idea of what's going on with these flow patterns and how they change. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what these values actually are. Um, but then if you look at literature, and this is one of the interesting things that we found when we were doing this, is so the surgeons, you know, very creative people, the vascular guys, and they tried lots of different things. So the guys tried a Linton patch where they put a patch of vein between the graft and the artery. This was to buffer the material mismatch. It didn't really change the geometry. Um, this was the Taylor patch, which essentially kind of did both things, which tried to alter the material mismatch in properties, but also looked acted like a diffuser, so made the area quite big. And then the Miller cuff. So these are three different ways that vascular surgeons trying to improve um, the patency rates of bypass surgery. And what you'd end up getting, though, if you look at literature, is that Taylor patch. Now, the best results that you'll see in this slide are Taylor Patch, but coincidentally this was published by Taylor, so let's, he's probably going to be good at the technique he developed. 
But if you take the Miller cuff and if you take the conventional bypass, you know, these are all pretty poor patents rates. They're all even at three years, you're looking at 35%, 35%, 40%. So you could see that even though the extremes of the fluid mechanics and what's possible in terms of a bypass graft and an interside junction had actually had actually been done well well before I tried to look at this, um, the patency rates bore out that really didn't didn't matter that much. So we published a paper with uh, Prof Grace and um, Mr. Kavanagh in 2003, so this was just a European Journal of Vascular Endovascular Surgery that an optimum to side graft artery junction geometry has yet to be determined and possibly may not exist. Now, when I wrote this sentence, I wrote does not exist, and the more sage senior authors calm me down and change the words to possibly may not exist. So um, what we did was when we were kind of looking at that, and I was kind of convinced that really with the fluid mechanics and the nature of the hemodynamics of the junction that you can't really do a lot more with it, what we did was to rather than kind of take your simple into side, what we, the idea that we came up with, a relatively simple idea, is that we just loop the flow from here and we bring some in up in underneath, get the flow to hit off itself. So what it does, it self-corrects and it all kind of moves off into the vein in nice controlled fashion. So essentially just creating a, a, you know, a different into side um, our downstream junction. So this is kind of what it would look like to give you an idea. Um, so this would be where you'd have your proximal junction and then you would have your venous junction would look like this, or your, your proximal, your distal junction, I should say. The venous part comes later when we talk about AV axis. And you have an interposition part here in between the arteries. So this would, you know, it's not straightforward. It's not like that they would just come along and cut the artery and put this in, but you're trying to evaluate it as a, as a concept. So what we did is we got a bunch of these made and what we did was essentially we tried to look at it as a bypass graft and we did that in, um, in the carotid artery of a sheep. And then, so when we tried to kind of develop that, well, we, you kind of see that it was of such a mature area that, um, and the economics of developing a graft wasn't um, that attractive to medical device companies. So we ended up looking at AV axis because this was one of the areas that was growing. So AV axis is arterial venous axis. And you're talking about joining an artery here. This is going to, there's a couple of cartoons of this for those of you who don't know what it is. But essentially this is using a graft to join arterial blood flow to venous blood flow in your arm. You need AV axis when your kidneys don't work. So once you get below about 10% of kidney function, they need to take blood out of your body, put it through a machine, clean it, put it back in. So that cleaning process takes about four hours um, and it's done about three times a week. Now you could, the reason we join the artery to the vein, there's a couple of things. You could take blood out of the vein, but essentially the flow rates would be so low that you don't be on the machine all the time. Whereas you're getting higher flow rates to, um, means you can do dialysis in that four hour time period. So again, the problems with these are patency rates. So you're 50% at one year and 25% at two years. So these are you know relatively sick people that, you know, when, when you do AV access, you have access to an arm and it upsets, you know, it upsets the vascular system essentially. So that if you can get the first one to last as long as you can, the chances are that you know, patients will stay alive a lot longer and you know, have a better chance of getting, on, um, getting to a transplant, which is the, obviously the ultimate treatment. So it's about 300,000 cases per annum and it grows at a rate of about 5%. So these are US numbers. Um, so it's 40% of the um, US patients is essentially have a graft and the other of them um, have fistulas. Now these numbers change. I have two different numbers in this presentation. It depends on where you are. So every couple of years the order, this, this changes. So um, a, in the early noughties there was an initiative called fistula first, first in the US which was basically trying to get them to just do fistulas first. In Europe, it's mostly that fistulas are done, but you get odd things like in Belgium, they do more grafts than they do fistulas. So it's all of these kind of strange things pop up. But it's a big, big problem, and um, you know, it's something that needs to be figured out. And again, it's, you know, it's a mechanical problem. It's something that, you know, that we can try and, and help um, solve. So what, in terms of access, so you have a fistula. Now, fistula doesn't have any device in it. Essentially, it's a surgical union of a, of a vein to a graft. You can get a couple of different configurations side to side, but generally what they'll do is cut the vein and join it to the side of the artery. The idea is that blood will flow down the artery and go back up the vein. If you put a graft in, it's a, which is a device, so that's where you would just have this looped graft here, and you can inject into that um, to take the blood out for, um, for the dialysis. 
So the increased incidence with obesity and diabetes is going to make, keep these numbers getting bigger for kidney disease. And with graphs, you have essentially, this gives you a modality of choice. It's a little bit higher in the US, um, there, but there's problems with them. And the problems, I'm going to just skip through these a little bit because you, you get the idea in a second. But the problems look exactly like the problems with bypass surgery. So you've got rejoining. Now, the host tissue here is a vein that you join the re return the flow into. It's not an artery. But essentially, the problems that you see are looking at about 49% of the problems or restenosis happens in the junction area, but you know almost so you're getting 93% of the issues actually happen in this area. Again, very similar to bypass surgery. So trying to figure out what the hemodynamics is and understand what's going on. So one of the things we wanted to do was look at the idea of kind of having this what we call the prolonged graph, but it's a different device. So now this is the healthy case, right? So I got into the MRI machine out in the hospital, so, and. Um, so what we did was basically just try and image up where my radial artery cephalic vein was and then we virtually implanted what this graft would look like. Now it does look, we made a couple of mistakes when we were doing this, so we, we did a very big long kind of loop in this. So we split it early, the thought process was that you'd have more real estate to in cannulate into for dialysis so we thought it would be a good thing. It ends up being very bulky and you know not so pretty. But that were, there were the decisions that we made. Now, you know, as engineers, so what we do is we do some computational models on them. We can show, for example, that you got any high shear stresses in here. So let me just kind of play that again. And you can kind of show that these ones are, um, this is where they're located. But this is all inside in the synthetic part of the graph. So this wouldn't, um, so this wouldn't really affect the host tissue. So the idea is that the vein is connected on up here where the flow has pretty well figured itself out. So what we did is we got a bunch of these things made and we did two preclinical trials. Uh, again, this, this, all this work was graciously funded by Enterprise Ireland. And um, so we did at two locations. So one in Pittsburgh, because they did the earlier trial as a bypass graft on the, on the, in the carotid of a sheep. So they implanted six prolong grafts and at Duke University we did 12. There's a couple of reasons we went to Duke. I'll come more apparent, I think, in, in the next slide or two. But, um, it was essentially the guy that was doing it, was a guy called Jeffrey Lawson, who's considered a key opinion leader in AV Axis. Um, so there was a couple of caveats. Now I'm going to present all the results, but some of them, so four of the surgeries based, this is based on how the surgeon thought the surgery went in terms of actually making the joining and, excuse me, whether there was any issues or not. So I'm presenting the results, results excuse me, as whether including and excluding this data. So Jeffrey Lawson published this paper in 2003, and it's essentially the kind of the gold standard, the industrial standard for evaluating if, if an AV access technology can, uh, you know, has actually any future. Um, and it's a hyperplastic model, so it's designed to fail. So at 30 days, you expect a patency rate of about 25%, and that's what it looks like. So in, what we got was essentially we had seven of 17 patent at 30 days. So we got about 41%. That's including all 17 implantations. So if we take out the six that, um, of the surgeries that actually didn't go in during the time of surgery according to the surgeons, so then what we're at is about 64%. So we kind of, you know, we were very happy with this and, and uh, Jeffrey Lawson was quite happy with how it turned out. And I suppose this is one of the scars I get to bear. So I spent about eight years and almost a million euros getting that graph and that's more or less where they stop. So we didn't manage, and we, we tried hard for years trying to get medical device companies interested in this, but you know, this is where the economics of all this stuff comes, in, comes to play. Medi um, for these graphs, there's three players, and one player is 70% of the market, um, and trying to, the cost required to demonstrate that this works that much better in, in, in people is actually preventative for, it doesn't make economic sense for them. So. This is kind of where we left it, and I was traumatized with, uh, with what went on in class three medical devices, so I said never again, uh, which of course never wasn't true. But So one of the things we ended up doing, and this was the kind of pitch, so it, that it wasn't this big clumpy thing, but it was the idea was that you would have this graft here, because we've got this little loop which is difficult to make, so we make it out of Dacron, so it's easy to stitch, but then we have this um, PTFE-based material which you can actually cannulate into and because Dacron isn't great to cannulate into so it was the idea was that this is what the graft would look like um, so once I got over that trauma we went back to trying to figure out what's going on in terms okay if we can't do something like this and we're stuck with intersides 
what should we do? So we went back to the published work and you know this is some of the work that and what I'm about to show you is on published work but I think it's going to it's probably going to figure out on the next five to ten years of what we're going to do in AV access. So what we do is typical engineering stuff so we essentially we create models of this so we apply what we call a bone structure here now we can then take this part I can make this graph for example six millimeters or five millimeters or four millimeters I can make the vein part representing a vein two three four five six you can get a myriad of different geometries out of this and you can figure out how things behave so for example taking that published uh, geometry which was reconstructed from a patient we can get a geometry that looks like this or like this. So here you've got a different graft angle here you've got a a vein that's bigger than the graft. Here you've got a graft that's almost the same size as the vein. And we do our computational fluid dynamics, which is CFD or color for doctors, as some people call it. And doctors, not just being clinicians for us as well, we like pretty pictures and, you know, whether it's right or wrong, if it looks good, we kind of we take that at the start. So what we did was we looked at really laminar versus turbulent. Now, what turbulent flow? Turbulent flow, hemodynamics, and blood flow is almost never turbulent. You know, it's a little bit turbulent in the aorta, but for the rest of your vascular system, it's not at all. You need nice, smooth. It's very energy efficient for things to, you know, go nice and smoothly, and you get better, better mass transport in and out of the blood to the tissues, everything like that. So, um, but one of the things that we do is when we're looking at turbulent flow, and this is what LES essentially means for, for everybody in the audience here is essentially this is our turbulent flow and we can model the flow looking at where the graft is much bigger than the vein and this is where you get your transition to turbulent so this will give you laminar flow so this is using a laminar and turbulent model so you get the same results when you should ha have laminar flow but this is where we get turbulent flow and what we can show here is if you've got a bigger graft than an artery and um, essentially what we're looking at here is just anything kind of yellowy red is just not good um, so you can see that that just the difference between them and including turbulent flow is actually happens way downstream whereas if the graft at the start is slightly bigger than the vein or which usually never happens but what can happen is the vein remodels up to be bigger than the graft what you'll see is that in these areas down here you're kind of moving the problems closer to the anastomosis so what we want to do is try and understand how this turbulence affects what's going on and I kind of traumatized one of my PhD students um, I made him about it, maybe about, almost a year to figure out how to present this. So I'm going to show you how I asked him to, and it took us a while to figure this out, and hopefully it'll make sense to you, because it's quite a difficult thing to, to, to capture, because there's an awful lot of stuff going on. But this is an idea, of, so you get the idea. So when you get the, the flow coming into the, into the vein here, so this is through the graph, and you can see you essentially you've got vortex shedding going on down here. Okay? So, and you can see how it changes. So what we want to do is try and capture what that is. So if you take this as one of the models I've shown earlier on, so this is your graft, this is your host vein, and we essentially we want to look along this direction, and if we take it and we want to unwrap it, so we cut it along this black line and unwrap it, so this is this essentially here is just a 2D map of what's going on, and it's at one particular point. Now with turbulence, the idea is that the flow changes and what's going on at any particular point changes as well. So this is actually a movie um, to try and un people understand. So in terms, oh, it doesn't come out that great, so you'll see a lot of flicking. Um, but these are all individual velocity vectors and how they change um, at particular points. So what we did, because it doesn't look great, was if we take that geometry and again, and it's not that this looks great, but this is the way we're trying to develop it. So what we did was we took areas, which is, for argument's sake, we'll say represents an endothelial cell, and if you've got an, a circle that looks like this and the arrow, this is essentially a time map. So if the arrow is predominantly looks like this, it's flow is essentially unidirectional. Whereas if it's down like this, it's fluctuating. And if you get disturbed flow, it looks like this. So and this is the map that you get. Whereas if we then color code these things, you get to see disturbed flow on the junction in these areas. But you get areas of uniform flow around it and then you get disturbed flow and you get all these different things. Then on top of that, what you want to know is what the actual shear stress is. So this is just the directionality of it. So how, what values it actually is. So what you have here is this is 50 pascals. So these white dots are 50 pascals. The dark ones are essentially low shear stresses. Now in a human vein, the values of, of shear stress from venous flow is about 0.2. So this, these white dots are 250 times higher than what's normally done. And you get this ridiculous, you know, you know, disturbed flow and there's no real direction to it. So these cells don't like it and don't really know how to respond. So this is um, unpublished data and this is more or less where we're at with this and we've 
a little bit later on, I think there's a couple of slides just talking about um, just talking about what we're kind of doing with AB access going forward. So as a complete change then, I think it's um, something, because I got traumatized with the class three stuff, one of the, we ended up working in a, with some of the urology people. And uh, one of the guys um, that was doing his training with um, Mr. Flood and Mr. Geary was Niall Davis. And so he ended up doing his PhD out in our lab. And one of the problems he came up with is that, that as a junior doc, because consultants really don't do this anymore, but junior docs, they put in urology catheters. So we submitted an idea um, to make that more safe. Um, it was essentially we, the technology won the inaugural Cleveland Clinic and Enterprise Ireland Innovation Award, and we got 340,000 euros from Enterprise Ireland to try and develop the technology. It's a very simple idea. It's what we call a class one device. So the class three are permanent implants such as the graft, whereas class one is something that, you know, it's much less, uh, much smaller regulatory hurdles to try and do and try and get over. So what this is, is essentially these just urology catheters. So this catheter is inserted through the penis up into the bladder. The bladder, the urine drains out of these here, and there's an anchoring balloon that's inflated to keep it in place. Um, so one of four people that get hospitalized have these, so there's a lot of them put in. And the incidence rate is about one in 100. Now that depends on literature, so some people, it's between 0.3 and 1%. We surveyed the 430, um, Surgical trainees in Ireland in 2013, 130 responded and four of them had misplaced one of these. So we were at almost 4% even from that. But there's 100 million of these globally. So economically, you know, so this is, there's a lot of these put in. Um, so the catheter kits cost between five and 10,000 euros, whereas one problem kind of, you know, is quite expensive to fix, especially because they don't pick it up that quickly or may not, depending on whether the patient is awake or not. So our simple solution, the idea was that we would just put a safety valve at the end of the syringe. Now they, you know, so valves are known and syringes are known and all that. So, but it's the pressure that this actually um, pops at and to cause the safety is where we got um, the intellectual property. Um, so what we did was essentially we just looked at that and what we, um, some of the work that we did in the lab was to demonstrate, for example, that when people inflate these balloons, depending on how quickly or how strong they are, they can actually create much higher pressures than people that take their time inflating it. So how do you set a pressure valve when you get your, this variable pressure? So we solved that by, set it, by having a flow restriction in, in the device. And we built these rigs, and as you do, um, to try and figure out how to deploy a consistent force on these syringes and then figure out a mechanism of doing that. So once we had that figured out, what we did was so the next step is to do some cadaveric work. So we did this and kind of showed that, you know, inflating a normal syringe, you get these very high pressures, but we were able to get ours to a certain level and then show that this valve did work. Now, one of the interesting things that, you can, that, that we found also you know, is to get our valve to work, we actually have to damage the urethra because you're assuming the balloon is misplaced, it's in the urethra. So, what we need to do is understand how the expansion of the balloon and how much damage you cause by building up the pressure in the balloon. The balloon expands in the urethra. The urethra provides resistance. That increases the pressure. It signals the valve outside. So what we did was just some laboratory work. So we got 21 porcelain urethras, purposely inflated balloons in them, and then we imaged the results afterwards. Um, so one mil inflation, we can show, for example, that there's no real problem with that. Whereas if, for example, you inflate a six mil a balloon through six mils of fluid, what you get is extravasation here, which is the real problem, and that leads to strictures. Again, you see the same thing, these plumes coming out through the urethral lumen um, and through the urethral wall. So showing that this extravasation, again, leading to strictures. So what we did with that was we came up with this graph, and, and um, so this is just very recent work, but essentially it kind of showed two things. This is a pressure versus diametric strain, so if you increase the pressure, how much stretch happens. And what you'll see is, first of all, these are the rupture values here, and these are the ones that didn't rupture. And um, so two things you can get from that. You need at least a pressure of over 150 kilopascals to get the, um, to cause rupture. And also you can see that you don't get any damage if you limit your expansion of the urethra to about 25%. So this is kind of useful information for us because it helps guide the, the actual final design of the device. <coughs> Now, one of the things that we do as well, so as engineers, you end up doing some work with industry. So I'm going to go through just these a couple of things really quickly. So, um, so drug-eluting balloons. So I did a little bit of work with Boston Scientific. 
And essentially what we do is a bunch of different stuff using computational fluid dynamics. And again, I'm showing these just to show the techniques that engineers can use and the diverse range of applications for them. So the idea with clinicians, if they come up with problems that they should talk to people that maybe can help try to figure out solutions. So we model a drug loading balloon. So we're able to show that areas are red here, are toxic areas, so areas where cells get too much drugs, and the blue areas are the sub-therapeutic areas. So stents actually are a pretty poor way of delivering drugs because they actually surface contact area is quite, is quite small. So I think a lot of this stuff will move, move towards drug looting balloons in the near future. Um, one of the things that, uh, it was an interesting project that we did, um, so this is for a company called Mackie, so this is ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and they were having problems particularly with the return. So what happens is that if you're, you, you're not oxygenating your blood, but your heart's still beating, essentially you take blood out of the vein, put it through a machine, and they put it back in, so they oxygenate the blood, essentially it's like dialysis. But these are, this is emergency stuff, so essentially these are very, very big catheters that are put in, so they're put in hopefully for a short period of time, in, in days, so I'm going to go through this because just on the, um, on the arterial side, on the return, so if you take the aortic arch, you've got this cannula up here, but one of the problems is that your heart is still beating, so you're actually returning blood flow in the wrong direction, and you're actually, with the heart still beating and still trying to produce, you're creating a pressure that the heart has to overcome. And they wanted to know uh, why patients in particular were having problems with their right side after a couple of days of being on this ECMO. And so, what we did was we were able to kind of show them that the reason why, you know, the red, which is the blood, just to keep everybody awake so we can see read red here, is coming out of the heart. This is deoxygenated blood because the lungs aren't really working. So what you'll see is that when the heart, um, uh, when the blood comes out of the left ventricle here, what happens is that because you've got blood flow coming up the aortic arch this time, so that it's only able to get into a certain, this um, subclavian artery here. So what you get is flow going off to the right side, there's a lot of actual deoxygenated blood sent around to that part of the body. Whereas on the left side, and um, what you'll see here, this is cons consistently supplied. So what we did was kind of show them why that was and to ask them to try and work on sequencing the pressure and then trying to figure out if they could you know, have another catheter coming in to, to absorb the blood from the left ventricle. So now getting towards the future, um, uh, of the research, and again, I'm going to couch this in something that we did recently, um, and there's quite a bit of um, work gone on that I'm not going to show, and I should, I probably should have started with an apology to a lot of my students, because there's a lot of work that we're not showing in this presentation, so, and it's not that it's not as good as this stuff, it's just that this, I thought, was going to give us a slightly different story, so, um, with carotid artery disease, we've done a couple of different things, now this is where you get blockage in your carotid artery leading to blood supply to your, to your head. Um, it's reasonably common. Uh, there's two ways to treat it. First is where you have an endarterectomy and they take the, just basically cut it up and pull it out and stitch you back up. And there's a big push, and there has been for years, trying to get minimally invasive treatments for carotid artery disease. Myself and um, in McAvena, we went at the uh, Charing Cross Surgical Meeting in 2005, and there was a Talk, so it was 90% open surgery, 10% stenting, and they were preaching by 2010 it would be 90% minimally invasive, 10% open. And it's almost about that. It's maybe 80% open now, 20%, but stenting, and it's one of the few territories in the body that's been very resistant to min minimally invasive treatments. Now, so some of the problems were, if you look at the literature, is that you get what's called neurological intolerance during minimally invasive treatments. This is where people you know, essentially can't. Um, take the what's going on during the surgery, so whether they start twitching on the table, things like that. So, this is looking at about 23% of patients had neurological intolerance. There's another study where you've only nine patients, but two again, and that's around 22%. So you're kind of wondering, well, why that is? And the other big point about this is that the gold standard still is the open surgery. The minimally invasive treatment isn't getting near the kind of values that you get with the open surgery. So, for example, if you were to have one of carotid artery disease, it's, there's a debate as to whether you should get it, um, whether stented or open surgery. Um, and, uh, that will depend, obviously, on patient um, presentation. So, in terms of the open surgery, what it looks like is this. So, you take out this plaque. Now, we have uh, done a, a lot of work with Eamon and Stuart Walsh, and over the last, um, gosh, I suppose it's almost five years now, we're taking these plaques out in an arterium testing, and I'm not presenting any of this work. Today. So one of my very able students, Hilary Barrett, is going to talk about that this afternoon. But so what we do is we kind of looked at it in, from a perspective of two ways, again being a kind of a, a treatment idea. So the idea is again with scarring, to, to the open surgery, you know, it's, it's better, 
but there is issues with it. So if we can get the minimally invasive stuff to work better, then the idea is people would, would, would go for that. So if you take your circular Willis anatomy, and this is moving up into the cranial vasculature, so what you'll see is that, so this is just a movie of it, but this circular Willis is a very important um, circle of blood vessels. It's essentially just in the middle of your brain and it distributes blood from, takes it from, essentially from the aorta, there's three vessels that take it up and distributes around the brain. So what you're looking at is this circle here. So what we'll talk about is, um, again, this is just showing you roughly what it looks like and roughly its position here. But the interesting thing about this is that the circular Willis, you know, less than one, in, no, it depends on the literature. In some literature, less than one in two people have a full <laughs> circle. Some literature, it's one in five. There's about 23 variations in the circular Willis. So, and it, most of them boil down to the communicating arteries. So this one you'll see here is a full circle. So these are your communicating arteries along here. And this is where what we call, now they're just put in, these are called hyperplastic. They can be missing or they can be very stringy like, but essentially they don't support uh, blood flow. So what we did was look at um, a bunch of different models. So for example, if you take a full circle here, now it's kind of difficult to understand, but coming towards or coming out of the screen here, up underneath. So these are your carotids and this is your basilar. Excuse me. And this is our experimental model of this as well. And essentially our three inflows look like this. And the way we approached this was that you, essentially your inflow is going to be enough to supply enough blood flow that you need at all of these, these outflows. So this is where blood goes off to the front of your brain, middle of your brain, and this is the back of your brain. So and we, we did this corresponding. So then um, experimentally um, with the corresponding, um, I suppose, circular Willis types. So for a very obvious one, right, is if you don't have these two communicating arteries here. So what you get is that your basilar artery is to supply the complete back, back of your brain, and then your, this, your left and right carotids then will supply the front and middle. We do the same experimentally, but what we could show is that for the, for, to achieve these outflows, the basilar actually has to increase its flow rate quite a bit, and you get slightly less flow in each of the carotids. So when we take that and we end up with this really complicated table, but bottom line with all the different variations, there's a little number down here. So this is 24.9 and this is 25.9%, depending which one is blocked. But that's very similar to the 22, 23% people that were suffering from neurological intolerance. And this kind of shows, these yellow bits here show the different case types and the types of anatomies that people shouldn't have minimally invasive surgery because they don't have enough collateral pathways to support blood flow during the surgery. And one of the things we did then was to try and figure out if, um, if when you're doing supporting, um, or trying to design a device that would support blood flow going through this. So essentially this is just a kind of cartoon um, movie of a device that we worked on, as I swore I'd never do a class three device, so this, well, this could be 2B, but it's the same boat. But this is an um, embolic protection device and a balloon, but we essentially we designed a minimum invasive balloon for carotid that would actually have a hole down the middle of it. So when it gets inflated, it would maintain perfusion during the surgery. Um, so that was one of the ideas. So to understand that, um, what we needed to then figure out was what this arterial plaque and how it would behave with that device in, in mind. So getting towards where we might talk about in terms of where we'd like to be, you know, in an ideal scenario then, so a clinician would take a patient-specific geometry with residual stresses. We would understand the particular specific mechanical properties of the of the plaque, so we'd get this all this information preoperatively. You get an in vivo estimation again of the structure of the device, the structure of collagen fibers, which will determine a lot of the um, mechanical behavior. We can then come up with actual stress maps. We could figure out what best type of stent suits a particular type of disease, or what type of patient, or what type of treatment could be used. So in an ideal scenario then, clinicians will be better informed. So this is where kind of biomedical engineering is going to hang out for quite a bit, and, but there's an awful lot of stuff to, needed to get there. So we're working on trying to develop this model for this plaque. So the arterial stuff is kind of, you know, it's well done, the healthy arterial stuff. Disease and the variation in disease isn't really done that much. Whereas the balloon and stent, they're very traditional materials, you can test those by just getting lots of materials. Whereas get, testing arterial plaques is very difficult, getting access to them and then testing them. So one of the things you want to do is we, we take the plaques um, and we essentially we orientate them in circumferential direction. We put, do mechanical testing, you pull them apart and you end up with a stress strain curve. This helps you understand their behavior. 
And one of the things that we did recently was just look at what was done around the world. So I'm not going to talk about this much more, um, but in terms of experimental studies and why you know, biomedical engineering and stuff that's being done has been done for a long time, but the question is, has it been done correctly? So the studies that have looked at mechanically characterizing um, arterial plaques are you know, listed here. Okay, so a lot of them did the carotids, but you've some did the aorta and the coronaries, but there isn't that many that did them to rupture so you can characterize them. And what we can do then is get plaque stress and strain values. But I'm going to move on a little bit and just talk about these are, I suppose, the four areas that looked at. So these are the people that did stress strain graphs. And this stuff actually, so the only people that have done this, and I presented this um, last June at the World Congress of Biomechanics. So this was a study that was done um, essentially for, on patients in Galway, and these two are patients in Limerick. So I was presenting at the World Congress, and really this just represented a bunch of paddies from the west of Ireland. Okay. Uh, so in the aortic, you get, get different properties, you can get iliacs um, and you get coronaries. So we can get these values, but so it's how you use them then. So engineers use them using numerical models, and there's lots of different ways that we do it, but when you look at the literature, all of these people have modeled carotids, coronaries, and lots of different times, and all they're based off one paper that was done in 1994, which characterized aortic tissue which is completely different to carotids or femorals or any of those. So the question is we need to be a little bit more careful about where we're taking the data from because it kind of gets into the ether. For what happens is that you know, people ref re um, reference somebody else that publishes. So this guy that published here would have done this, this paper here and this paper then would have referenced that and all of a sudden it just kind of gets into the, into the folklore almost. So if you look at the, all the different ways of testing these plaques, and there's lots of them, people take them from autopsy, from endarterectomy, so you get them where you can, refrigerate them, some do it fresh, some do it frozen. The mechanical testing is, you know, is so varied, it's unbelievable. So people take you know, lots of different preconditioning, um, and I'm not gonna, these are all the mechanical um, kind of variables that need to be controlled when testing. I'm not going to dwell too much on them, but essentially people, some people don't preload or else don't report it. They use different strain rates. They confuse strain rates with displacement rates. And they basically, some people do it at uh, body temperatures and some don't. So you get huge variations. They use different uh, geometries and then they test different parts of the plaques. So some test fibrous caps, some test the whole plaques. And it all gets you know, quite messy. And one of the things that we did do was look at the literature then and try and figure out in terms of the stress values. You're looking at 300 kilopascals, so this is one of the things that gets into literature. And um, what happened was this guy Cheng wrote that it should not be assumed that all plaques fracture at this value, so understanding how this tissue behaves. And then you get a bunch of people publishing from one value that was with the caveat that it shouldn't be used. And this isn't true, so these diff plaques diff will have different performances with different stuff. So where we want to get to is obviously to a place where you kind of need a lot less instructions in terms of how to test plaques. It should become very, very obvious to people what they need to do. So in summary, we kind of need to standardize this testing and we need to look at a little bit more, um, more behavior, what's going on. And in terms of arterial plaques, and this is just a, a slide, it's a table of essentially what's going on in what we're doing at the moment, which is we have an EU project going in. There is one, two, four industry partners there's different clinicians, different types of engineers involved, and it's this kind of thing that I'm going to mention just at the end. And in terms of AV access, we have an EU project existing now, which has just started, it's 2.7 million euros, and that is essentially a bunch of medical people from Dundee, from Birmingham, we're the engineers, and there's two companies, again, trying to figure out what's going on and how these, um, with these AV access and how patients can be better treated. And one of the things we're doing in that is looking at flow in, in veins. Um, and that's kind of getting really towards the dark arts of, of poking cells and trying to figure out what they're doing. So, um, but luckily there's some people that, uh, in our department that actually like the dark art of poking cells. So one of them is David Hoy, who I'm going to mention. So himself and, uh, myself, David, and um, Amy DeBar essentially have the, the, the Center for Applied Biomedical Engineering Research. So I asked them for one slide each, and I got three from David and four from Eamon. So I'm going to go through these very quickly. Just, but anybody that's interested in this kind of work, the guys are here, and we're happy to talk to you. But, so what a David's work is looking at bone and trying to figure out what's going on at a, at a tissue level. Um, so here, this is just loading the ulnar of a mouse here. And it's trying to figure out whether um, osteocytes and osteoblasts whether, and how they regulate um, the tissue behavior. 
going down to the cellular level, it's trying to figure out what's going on and how these, it's kind of more mechanobiology, how these forces are sensed. And you know, one of the things he looks at is this primary cilia, and he's, he gave me this slide with all these ciliopathies. And one of our colleagues reckons that somebody had suffers from ciliopathy, somebody that believes that the primary cilia exist. But he's convinced us that, that they do, and he's working on techniques to try and show how it senses what's going on in cells. And the other work that he does then is on biomaterials, um, looking at the electrospinning, and then trying to load up the, essentially the electrospun materials that they, that they have with calcium phosphates. And he's doing this work with Eamon Debarra. And Eamon's lab essentially focuses on bone loss. It's more very, he's an awful lot of industry funding um, in his lab. And it's working on different orthopedic um, treatments. So one of them is looking at calcium phosphate bone cement. So looking really at getting a preloaded injectable cement. Um, the other part is glass ionomer cement. So this is looking at essentially getting towards biodegradable adhesives and biomimetic mechanical properties of materials that aren't really that great at the moment at what they do. And you've got this PMMA um, acrylic bone cement. So trying to figure out what's going on with the raw materials, mechanical properties and look at novel formations for these kind of applications. So to finish up, really where the future for biomedical engineering research is going to be multidisciplinary teams. And it's not like when I started out, which was myself, Tim McLaughlin, and Pierce Grace, so you're the clinician engineer, but you're going to have lots of different types of engineers. So those that poke cells, those that do numerical modeling, those biomaterials. You're going to have lots of different scientists, so molecular scientists, lots of different types of clinicians. So our, e, our AV Access project has radiologists and vascular surgeons, so, and you'll have medical teams involved in that. And then lots of different types of industry. So it's proper multidisciplinary, not just that. And I think you know, a lot of the future is going to be on EU funding, which is going to take big teams and have lots of these different kinds of teams in it. What I'd like to see is more clinical training in biomedical engineering labs. So a lot of us have um, trainee clinicians who come and do MDs, MCHs, PhDs in our labs, and it's really, really good. And in particular, what I'd like to see, which doesn't happen as much, is more of the engineers and scientists going and working in clinical environments. And then I kind of you know, propose that biomedical engineering and its future will be almost considered a new strand of medicine and something that's accepted as, as part of that. Um, so let me finish by acknowledging my uh, funding and those poor people that have put up with me for a lot of time. And this is Kaber. So let me just point out, this is David Hoy here. This is Evan DeBar and this is myself. And these are been all the people that actually do the work. So with that, I thank you folks and I'll be happy to take any questions.